Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we are going to be looking at evolution as it has been observed in laboratory conditions. There are several intriguing experiments to talk about, so let's just get right to it. First, let's just discuss how these experiments are set up. Studying evolution in the wild can be incredibly difficult because there are just too many factors that can't be controlled by the experimenters. It is possible to study the actual evolution, but to determine which selection pressures led to which traits is a lot more complicated just because of the sheer number of selection pressures. So for today, I'm going to be sticking to lab settings. In a lab, the experimenters will have something specific in mind that they are seeking to test. As such, the experiments will be designed in such a way as to eliminate what are called confounding factors. Confounding factors are variables that could have an effect on the outcome of the experiment without necessarily having any indication for the experiment. So to steal the example from Wikipedia, if you set up a study attempting to find out if the birth order of children is causally linked to Down syndrome, maternal age would be a confounding factor. Maternal age is causally linked to Down syndrome, and a third child is more likely to be born when the mother is older, so you might see a link between Down syndrome and birth order, but not because being born third can cause Down syndrome, rather it would be because of the confounding factor of maternal age. So when we are looking at experimental evolution, we are looking for experiments that have a good design to try and minimize these confounding factors. Keep in mind that the design of these experiments is not to force a preferred outcome, it is to test and see if the expected outcome matches up with reality. So when looking at one of my favorite experiments, where single-celled algae developed multicellularity as a heritable trait, the experiment was designed to figure out whether or not predation would eventually result in multicellularity. Since they were trying to figure out whether this specific mechanism is capable of causing multicellularity, the experiment was designed so that they were starting off with a wide range of genetic diversity, but that this diversity would be subject to as few selection pressures as possible in order to test the one selection pressure that they were interested in. So in this experiment, they took five independent colonies of algae and exposed them to a filter-feeding amoeba as a predator. They also had two colonies that were not exposed to the predator as a control group. The idea being that if there is a confounding factor that they have not accounted for, it should affect the controlled group as well. So if they see something remarkable in one of the experimental populations and in one of the control groups, then they know there's something other than the presence of the predator that caused that result. So the five colonies of algae are exposed to the predator, which, because of its feeding mechanism, puts a selection pressure on the algae to increase in size. Two of the five colonies developed characteristics of multicellularity, strain B2 and B5. Notably, they achieve multicellularity through different methods. The B2 strain formed clusters of cells with no particular arrangement or number, while B5 preferred to form in clusters of eight cells. The B5 population also went through different life stages, starting out as unicellular going through a four-celled stage before finally ending up as an eight-celled organism. In both cases, the individual cells were grouped together within the extracellular matrix, which indicates that they formed that way through division of cells from within the cluster, rather than by being separate cells collected together to form an aggregate. Researchers then continued breeding the populations of B2 and B5 strains to ensure heritability, and they occasionally did separate them out into individual populations again. Now, the algae didn't just develop multicellularity, they developed new life cycles to accommodate multicellularity, and each colony went about it slightly differently. Wild type and control group algae go through a stage where they lose their motility and then go through two to five rounds of mitosis, or cell division, before releasing single cells that are themselves motile and then returning to their normal single cellular life. Now, of the strains that had developed multicellularity, two of them kept a life cycle that is similar to wild algae, but the remaining strains were distinct. In some of the strains, after a cluster of cells undergoes division, it stays close to its parent cells because it's embedded in the extracellular matrix, or ECM. They can sometimes capture additional cells and incorporate them into the matrix. In others, the cell clusters are made up of only direct descendants, meaning that they did not aggregate with free-swimming cells like some of the other strains did, but they stayed multicellular purely through reproduction. Because of this, in those strains all of the genetic material within the clusters would be identical, meaning that these multicellular clusters would themselves work as units of selection, which basically means that they are a singular organism. There are no selective pressures that would favor one cell in the colony over another, as they share the same genetic material, so further selective pressures would be against the cluster of cells as a whole, compared to other similar clusters of cells. 
What's more, the process that these algae went through that led to the development of multicellularity as a stable, heritable trait matches the prediction that was made in another paper about how this might have happened in the wild. The algae from the experiment ended up looking morphologically very similar to the different species of algae that was discussed in the paper that made that prediction, as well as having similar methods of genetically controlling how many cells are in their colony. And as the icing on the cake, the trait of multicellularity took about one year to develop, and has remained stably heritable for at least four years. This is fascinating evolutionary research, and it helps us discover the processes that could have led to the first appearance of multicellularity, and it demonstrates that it's not a huge, unobtainable step in the process, but is actually surprisingly simple. Next up, let's look at an experiment that has been going on for 32 years now, the long-term E. coli evolution experiment. E. coli are an excellent organism for experimental evolution, as they are easy to grow and count, they grow in simple environments that are easy to control, they have short generational times, I mean this experiment is now past 70,000 generations since it began and it's still going, they can be frozen, and they can survive the freezing and thawing process so it's possible to have an ongoing archive that can be restarted at any time, so if you discover something significant that has changed in a population, you can go back into the freezer to find out exactly when the change started, and even restart an old population to see if the change will happen again. For this particular experiment, they used E. coli that had reproduced strictly clonally, meaning there is no horizontal gene transfer to muck things up as it so often does. This also helps with avoiding cross-contamination. They can place a marker at a specific point on a bacterium's genome, and it will stay put within that population, so it gives an easy way to tell the different populations apart. And because it is so easy to work with, it has become one of the most well-studied species on the planet, so there is already a wealth of research and data available for it. In this particular experiment, they started with 12 populations of E. coli, all founded from the same ancestor so that they would be genetically identical, with the exception of the genetic marker used to distinguish the populations from each other. And because of the presence of these markers, periodic freezing of colony samples, and the fact that they can revive from being frozen, it is very easy in this experiment for them to eliminate cross-contamination. If any is detected, they simply get rid of the contaminated sample and start over from a previous non-contaminated frozen generation. Because this experiment has been going on for so long, there have been dozens of publications and research papers that have come out of it that have helped us understand mutation rates, antibiotic resistance, the prevalence of beneficial mutations, the process of clonal interference, speciation, the development of new traits, and more. I want to focus here on the development of the ability to metabolize citrate. This is an important trait because one of the defining characteristics that makes E. coli what it is, is its inability to metabolize citrate in aerobic conditions. Checking for citrate metabolism is one of the main ways to test for the presence of E. coli. In the experiment, they grow the bacteria in a solution known as DM25, in which glucose is the only available food source that E. coli is able to utilize, but which does contain 250 milligrams of citrate. The E. coli is allowed to grow in the medium throughout the day, but runs out of glucose in about 8 hours, which causes them to stop multiplying. After 22 to 26 hours, 1 milliliter of the solution containing the E. coli is transferred into a new DM25 solution, and so it will resume growth. After 31,500 generations, some of the populations didn't stop growing after the initial 8 hours of glucose, their growth just slowed down a bit. These populations have been tested on various other growth mediums, several of them with citrate as the only available food source, and these populations, known as CIT+, were able to survive on citrate alone. And because of the procedures used in this experiment to eliminate contamination, they were able to completely rule out the possibility of contamination in this case. And because they freeze generational samples every 500 generations, they were able to determine by rerunning the experiment with previous generations that the underlying mutation that ended up leading to the development of citrate metabolism happened around generation 20,000. This means that the ability to metabolize citrate was dependent upon a separate mutation that may have had a completely different function sometime just before the 20,000th generation. This is an excellent demonstration of the idea that the order in which an essentially random beneficial mutation arises can have have a profound impact on the future evolution of that species. And as the original strain of E. coli was strictly asexual, all of the changes between the recent generations and the original strain are purely the results of mutation and genetic drift. Even ignoring the fact that one strain developed the completely new characteristic of being able to metabolize citrate, there have been numerous other examples of phenotypic and genetic evolution throughout the experiment. Because the main selection pressure in the experiment is the availability of glucose, 
All 12 populations develop mechanisms to improve their growth rates on the limited supply of glucose. They also decrease their lag phase when transferred into a fresh medium, they develop larger average cell sizes, and reduce their peak population densities. These are examples of convergent evolution, where similar means of adapting to a similar situation developed completely independently. An important thing to keep in mind here is that, at its core, this is evolution in action. I have seen people respond to the study with the criticism that the new E. coli are still just bacteria, but it is important to realize that bacteria are the most diverse organisms on the planet. It's hard to tell, but it's estimated that there could be upwards of 1 trillion species of bacteria on Earth. 500 to 1,000 species of bacteria live inside each human being. So to dismiss a speciation event in bacteria because it's still bacteria is akin to saying that the differences between humans and elephants are irrelevant because they are both eukaryotes. Next up, let's take a look at a fruit fly experiment that's been going on for about twice as long as the E. coli experiment, but it hasn't shown quite the same dramatic results. Probably has something to do with the fact that while fruit flies reproduce very quickly, their generational time is nowhere near as fast as E. coli, so in 60 years they have had about 1,500 generations, rather than the over 70,000 generations that the E. coli guys are up to now. But fruit flies are an excellent way to study evolution in macroorganisms, as they do have remarkably fast generation times for a macroorganism. The fruit fly experiment began in 1954 and reared the flies completely normally with the exception of being in complete darkness. The fruit flies still look like normal flies, but their head bristles, which are used as sensory organs, are longer, they have a better sense of smell, and they're more adept at finding a mate in the dark when compared to normal flies. Despite these differences, they still maintain their circadian rhythm and are still attracted to lights. Perhaps the biggest problem with the dark fly experiment to date is that the control group of flies was wiped out by a faulty incubator, so there's no group of flies raised in identical conditions but exposed to light for the entire 60 years. So even though researchers have identified more than 220,000 single point mutations and over 4,000 insertion or deletion mutations in the dark fly genome, it is difficult to determine which of these mutations are specific adaptations for adjusting to life in the dark. To get around this problem, researchers designed an experiment that would effectively reselect the mutations that were specifically adapted for life in the dark. They mixed populations of the dark fly with wild fly populations, and kept one group in constant darkness, and another group in normal day-night cycles. The idea here is that the recombination during sexual reproduction would cause the mutations whose occurrence had nothing to do with being kept in the dark to gradually become less prevalent in the population that was exposed to day-night cycles, but would be selected for in the dark population, so the genes whose prevalence was maintained through another 49 generations would be likely candidates for having an effect on the fly's success in living in the dark. Several of these candidate genes were found in several spots on the genome. So in these three experiments, we witnessed several key aspects of evolution in action. The development of multicellularity as a defensive mechanism, the ability to adapt to a new food source when the primary food source becomes scarce, and the selection of mutations that are favorable in an environment. All of these operate on the same basic mechanisms, random mutations, genetic drift, and natural selection. And these experiments have demonstrated evolution's ability to produce new features and functions, all while building on already existing features and functions. That's it for today. If you'd like to support this series, you can do so at patreon.com slash vicerhino for as little as a dollar per episode. You can also find me on Twitter at vicerhino and find links to my website and Facebook page as well as my P.O. Box address in the description. See you next time.